Sam Hibbins. Um, we're going to go for about an hour tonight, just so you know. And we'll get started with Sam giving us a bit of a rundown as to where this tax has come from and a bit of the political history. And then I'll have a chat about um, why we think it's a bad idea. And then we'll talk about what we think that we can do about it. So over to you, Sam. Cheers. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you for taking over the uh, hosting duties. Apologies to everyone for my croaky voice. Hopefully I'll make it through the hour. Um, so yeah, just a bit of an update is in terms of just what's happened so far um, with the EV tax now campaign to stop it. Um, as you would be aware in October, in October's um, state budget, the Victorian ABA government uh, announced they wanted to put a tax on electric vehicles, a, a user charge on um, electric vehicles. Um, this came off the back of a similar announcement in South Australia. Uh, and at the time, uh, New South Wales indicated that they were looking uh, at a similar scheme as well. Uh, now, obviously, there was a, a big backlash uh, against this, a lot of community outrage. Uh, and of course, there would be, because this absolutely flies in the face uh, of what we need to be doing on electric vehicles, which is actually to make them more affordable, um, not more expensive as this as this tax does. Um, and we've led the charge, the Greens have led the charge against this uh, in Parliament, in Victoria and in other states uh, as well. Uh, we were the first ones to come out and oppose this tax. Um, we've had thousands of people um, signing our petition uh, against the to block the EV tax. It's been one of our biggest ever campaigns. Uh, and we've also got industry and environmental groups as well campaigning to stop the EV tax. Um, you know, you've got the Electric Vehicles Council, uh, the Australia Institute, Solar Citizens, get up to and yeah, get up just to name a few. Um, you know, we always talk about having uh, you know the the environmental and industry uh, movements aligned. Uh, as that's an outcome we want. Well, the, the Labor government have done it pretty well in this uh, instant because the industry and environment are very much aligned against uh, their tax on electric vehicles. Uh, when this looked like it was being a something that was going to be brought in nationally, and, and it's since it's since come out that actually it was the Victorian government that was leading the charge uh, amongst um, the Board of Treasurers, amongst other states, uh, to introduce this uh, tax. Uh, when it looked like it was becoming a national scheme before Christmas, uh, you might have joined us in our uh, online event where we hosted Greens MPs from around the country, uh, from South Australia and New South Wales, when they were looking to bring in this tax uh, from uh, federal Greens as well as ACT Greens, where they've got really good EV policies um, to discuss how we can actually, uh, in our various states, how we can actually stop these um, pro proposed EV taxes. And since then, uh, the South Australian government has uh, delayed, inverted commas, their scheme until after the next election. And I think we all know what that means. Sorry, someone just muted me. Um, uh, and they, the reason why they've delayed that uh, scheme uh, is because uh, their parliament was going to knock it off. Uh, Greens, uh, the Labor, I mean, this was introduced by Liberal South Australian government. So the Labor opposition there came out very strongly uh, against the EV uh, tax, uh, crossbench MPs as well. Uh, they said they'd block it and the government didn't end up uh, introducing it into Parliament and have now delayed it until after the next election. In New South Wales, uh, their Environment Minister has come out against an EV tax. Uh, this is despite their Treasurer floating uh, the idea. Um, and you know, here in Victoria, our Environment Minister has come out in support of the EV tax. Uh, pretty much no other state or territory is actually looking to bring in uh, an EV tax. So it does look like it's Victoria that's actually going it alone now. Uh, federally, uh, the Greens uh, through Janet Rice, uh, we actually introduced uh, legislation that would actually penalise states that, entered, that brought in an EV tax. And that, uh, that bill has actually gone on to um, inquiry stage uh, and we also successfully passed uh, a motion in the Senate opposing the EV, you know, EV taxes uh, across the country, uh, which my understanding was supported by government opposition uh, and other parties as well. Um, but despite all this, despite all this, the Victorian government uh, have introduced uh, legislation just in the last uh, sitting week to bring in an EV tax. They're absolutely determined to seem to be determined uh, to go it alone. Uh, in introducing a new charge on electric vehicles. And in fact, if this bill passes, uh, Victoria would actually be the only government in the world 
making electric vehicles more expensive uh, and not more affordable. Uh, the bill itself, uh, well, it says what it, it does. Uh, interestingly, within the bill itself, there's no uh, link between uh, road funding and the revenue raised by the uh, EV tax, which is something that um, you know the government has been talking about a lot, current coming up with this fictitious misleading argument that there's a link between uh, road user charging or fuel excise and road maintenance. They had the ability to have put that link in the, the legislation that they brought forward. Uh, they haven't put that link in. Uh, the bill also, interesting, allows the government to, to raise or lower the rate uh, as they please uh, without going back to parliament. So where we're up to now uh, is it's now up to, I was hoping that the government would see the light uh, and not proceed with this uh, ridiculous tax on electric vehicles. Uh, they haven't done that. So now it's up to the parliament to block it. Uh, as I said, in South Australia, uh, their upper house had the numbers uh, to block that legislation and now it's been delayed and hopefully cancelled forever. Um, so uh, the, the takeaway message from tonight really is to contact uh, your upper house uh, MP. Uh, and I believe we're going to be providing some contact details as well in the chat. Uh, many of you uh, may already have written to, the, to your upper house MP through um, our online submission form and that's had a really good impact so far. I think we've had over 700 uh, submissions uh, and at least one MP, one upper house MP, um, uh, Clifford Hayes from the Sustainable Australia Party has written back to to um, people and said that he'll be opposing that um, opposing that legislation. So um, the numbers are going to be tight. It is very difficult to um, be very difficult to uh, block uh, legislation in the upper house, despite the government not having a majority. Uh, and so, by all means, if you've written to your MP, uh, well then call your MP as well. Uh, they need to hear our voices loud and clear on this. Um, you know, one of the one of the things uh, I've been asked a lot is why is the why is the government doing this? Why are they doing this? Well, one of the reasons I think they're doing it is because they think they can get away with it. Uh, that's a simple that's a simple fact, um, and that's why any uh, you know any upper house worth its salt, any parliament worth its salt, uh, needs to actually uh, play a role and actually block the, this tax on electric vehicles, uh, and so. Uh, we really need that pressure now to be put on uh, crossbench MPs. Uh, we know that the opposition, the Liberal opposition here in Victoria has actually come out and say they're, they're, they're opposing this uh, bill. So it's now going to be up to just a handful of MPs in the Victorian upper house to determine whether uh, this electric vehicles goes through uh, or actually gets knocked off. And this is a real big test for the Victorian parliament. Uh, it's clear that the community is against uh, this bill. Uh, and we've got to make our voices absolutely loud and clear between now and when this bill goes for a vote, presumably before the uh, end of the financial year. So look, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's going to be, it's a tough job to knock off legislation in the upper house in Victoria. But I think with our, you know, we really got to make sure that our voices be heard and keep up the pressure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for that overview. Um, I was just going to add a little bit more to that before we go to questions. So one thing that sometimes gets lost is talk of climate change and emissions um, when we talk about the electric car tax. So many of you would know that if you look at the, the data around emissions in Victoria, transport is the second, um, second highest amount of emissions per sector. So most of our emissions come from electricity generation here in Victoria, but second to that is transport emissions. And more than 50% of that is car use. So it is a huge amount of emissions, but not only that, it's actually the fastest growing sector. So electricity emissions on the down, um, downslide in Victoria, but transport emissions are growing and it's the fastest growing sector of emissions. So anything we can do to electrify and to reduce emissions from the transport sector will have a huge impact on when it comes to climate change here in Victoria. And some other stats for you. Uh, in 2020, so last year, in Australia, tell me how much, how many cars as a percentage of cars sold in Australia were electric vehicles? Put, put, your, um, put your guesses in the chat. So of all the cars sold in Victoria, new car sales, 
in Victoria, uh, sorry, in Australia, new car sales in Australia last year, how many as a percentage were elected? I've got I lots of people saying less than 1% and you would be correct, it's 0.7%. Very knowledgeable uh, audience tonight. Yeah, that's right. So 0.7% of cars sold in Australia were electric vehicles. Globally, it's 5% and in Europe, it's more than 10%. So we're 10 to 20 times, more than 10 to 20 times behind the rest of the world. Um, in the UK, they went from 3% in 2019 up to more than 10% last year. So we are significantly behind the rest of the world. Um, Sam mentioned that you know, why is the Labor government doing this? And the Treasurer has two arguments that he uses. The main argument that he uses in public is, oh, well, we have to, electric vehicles have to pay their fair share um, because petrol vehicles, they have the petrol excise, uh, that pays for our roads, EVs are not paying for our roads. Well, that's a complete furphy because petrol excise hasn't funded our roads since the 1950s. General tax revenue funds our roads. Everybody pays that, it comes from our general taxes. Um, road, fuel excise doesn't pay for that. There may be a point in the future where we need to move to a different pricing model as more EVs into the market as we have fewer and fewer petrol and diesel cars. But now is absolutely not the time to do that when we are 10 to 20 times behind the rest of the world. Um, it will kill electric cars in this country and the industry um, is very concerned about that. Um, the other argument that he uses, but he uses this really just in private, is that, um, well, the feds are going to do it and we want to get in first in here in Victoria to get that revenue. So it's a real revenue grab from the Victorian government. They're saying, well, if this is going to happen, if this is going to be inevitable, Victoria wants the money, not the federal government. But now is absolutely, as we say, not the time to introduce something like this, particularly something that has just an impact on electric vehicles rather than across the board. Um, we also know that in terms of the barriers to people buying electric vehicles, the number one barrier is the upfront cost. And so anything that increases the upfront cost, which this will do every single year, increase the cost, um, is going to be a disincentive, but anything that can bring down the upfront cost will be a real incentive to people buying electric cars. And around the world, many countries have significant subsidies for buying electric cars. In some places in Europe, we have subsidies of around the $10,000 mark. And so these are the kinds of things we actually need to institute here in Victoria is things that bring down that upfront cost. The government will say, oh, we're rolling out more charging stations across the country, but that's not really the barrier to people. People, when they think about buying an electric car, they don't automatically think, oh, great, free charging on the side of the road. What they think of is the upfront cost and the upfront cost is significant here in Australia. So we need things that bring down that upfront cost. So the Greens have actually, Sam's office has done the policy work and said, well, what what should the Victorian government be doing to bring down these costs? What are some alternative plans? So obviously repeal the tax, but also upfront bonuses for the purchase of vehicles under a certain amount, say under $77,000, we could have a $10,000 uh, bonus to purchase electric vehicles and that would bring us in line to some of these some European the countries European that are doing the same thing. Um, we need to abolish need stamp to abolish duty on electric duty vehicles. On electric vehicles. Um, um, and, and have things, like, things free like free registration. So all of this so will bring down the cost um, and encourage people. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's other quite thing interesting, interesting is that we are very we far are very behind far when it comes to electric buses and government fleet as well, um, which it seems like a no brainer, but the government just hasn't put in the work. So we need to manufacture Australian made electric buses right here. Uh, there was recently, I think a trial where we have one electric bus in Victoria, which is pretty ridiculous in this day and age. And we have very little incentives for fleets to be moved to, um, to transition to electric. Whereas if you look at somewhere like the US, they're moving, Joe Biden is whole scale moving government fleets to electric vehicles. So we are quite far behind the rest of the world. There is more we need to do. And we recently did a survey um, of just our supporters and talked about you know, what would encourage them to, to buy an electric vehicle. We had over a thousand responders 
and 97% said they want their next car to be an electric vehicle. Um, and so I think that's a pretty, um, it's pretty overwhelming that the sentiment in the community is that people want to do the right thing. They want to move to electric vehicles. Um, and over 70% of them said the tax would dissuade them from doing so. So that's just some stats to give you a bit of a sense of why the government's doing this, um, what we need to do instead, and how this is absolutely not the right time to do it when we're so far behind the rest of the world. As Sam said, our best way to stop this is by getting the crossbench to oppose it. And just some numbers for you. In the upper house, the government needs their own members plus three crossbenchers to support legislation to get it passed. The Liberals have said they will oppose this tax. Um, so that's the first hurdle we need to get over. Now the government needs three more votes. There are 10 crossbenchers. So it is going to be a challenge uh, to, you know, we need eight of those crossbenchers to say no, because the government only needs to carve off three of them. But we think we can do it. And these crossbenchers are very much persuadable by the public. They're very much susceptible to public pressure. They very much care what the public thinks. They're all on very thin margins. So anything that you can do to contact this crossbench and we'll put their contact in the chat, email them. If you've already emailed them, call them. Please do so. This is our absolute best chance, really our only chance of stopping this tax. So now with all of that, let's go to your questions. And um, one of our staff members, James, has been putting them in a document for us. Uh, first one probably to you, Sam, from Andrew, who says, all of this seems to conflict with Federal Labor's new policy, which was just announced. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, well, I mean, it just goes to show that, I mean, for those who, who might not be aware, so um, Federal Labor today announced some policies um, which, um, you know, looked at reducing the price of an electric vehicle, you know, somewhat um, similar to what um, we've been we've been pushing for. Um, and this, I think this again just goes to show how just out of step uh, the Victorian Labor government are uh, with not only their the rest of the country, with everyone around the country, but their Labor colleagues as well, um, who, um, you know, are wanting to make electric vehicles uh, more affordable, not like here in Victoria, where they want to make them more expensive. And, you know, and as I said before, it was uh, the Labor South Australia, uh, Labor opposition, uh, who opposed this in South Australia, along with the Greens who helped stop it. Um, federal Labor supported our motions uh, opposing the EV tax. Uh, and it just goes to show uh, just how much out on, a, out on a limb and out on a rock uh, the Victorian Labor government are with this. And, you know, I was hoping that they would see the light uh, in uh, and withdraw this bill and, and not go forward with it. Uh, but they seem uh, stubborn enough to do that. And I guess that's, that's why it's now up to Parliament. It's up to the Victorian Parliament now to knock it off. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Um, so there's a few comments in here which are quite useful, but please keep putting your questions through. Uh, Spike says he paid the greater upfront cost of an EV knowing he would have lower running costs. So it isn't just about purchase price. Mm. Well, that's, um, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. Um, and in fact, one of the, uh, one of the um, I think, the, the adverse effects of this tax um, was actually um, disadvantaged, I think, EV users in terms of uh, those, you know, fuel efficient cars um, are actually uh, I think going to be now better placed in terms of running costs than electric vehicles in some instances. Uh, you know, the, the Treasurer talks about maybe lost revenue from EVs. Uh, the lost revenue from um, fuel excise is due to, is due to fuel efficient um, petrol vehicles. Uh, and so this, this uh, tax really hasn't been, it really is um, a rush job. As Ellen said, you know, I think the Treasurer has rushed this in. It's a rush job. Um, and, you know, any upper house or any parliament worth its salt should really be knocking this off just like they've done in other states. Thanks, Sam. Um, David asks, in the UK, is it true that non-EV car sales will cease in 2030? Well, this is the case. I mean, now we're seeing, um, it just goes to show just how much uh, Australia uh, is already behind the world when it comes to electric vehicle um, initiatives. Not only have you got really good, strong subsidies um, to purchase electric vehicles Europe and across America, 
and now a lot of countries are now introducing legislation where they're simply going to put a ban on the the, the sale of um, uh, the internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, so that is the case in the UK and it's becoming the case in other countries as well. Uh, so one of the galling things about this, this new tax is we're already so far behind the rest of the world. Uh, industry is saying we, we, we can't actually justify importing our cars into, into Australia. Uh, we can't actually um, justify investing in EVs in Victoria because the policies are so bad. Then you add this uh, tax on top of it. Um, so yeah, just another uh, just another another reason how just another demonstration about how far we already are behind and um, why this tax is such a bad idea. Thanks, Sam. And I mentioned in my presentation that in the UK uh, we saw EV sales increase from three percent to over ten percent in the UK over the last couple of years. Do you know why that was, Sam, and whether the UK has got any particular incentive? Well, I think the UK. My understanding is the UK incentives are, are, are really. Are, uh, very now on par with um, some other parts of Europe, but I don't have those exact those exact details. Mm. I think there's lots of incentives right across Europe. Some places have uh, kind of upfront cash grants, others just have rolled out charging infrastructure much more quickly. And what it's led to is my understanding is that then the industry goes into those markets because they see that there's demand there and then it kind of fuels itself. Whereas here in Victoria, we're seeing not a lot of entrance into the market because there's just no, there's hardly any market here for EVs. And so the industry is kind of crying out for something to, to help bring electric cars here to Australia. Mm. We're not even really importing them very well. Um, Colin asked how many of the crossbench are green. So I mentioned that there's um, 10 on the crossbench. There's actually 11 because one of them is a um, disgraced former Labor member who now kind of sits on the cross bench, but he generally doesn't vote. But um, of those 10, there's only one green. So the three of us, Tim, Sam and I are in the lower house, so we're not in that upper house cross bench, it's just our leader, Samantha Ratnam. So um, we are, we need, as I mentioned, eight to, to block it. So the government needs three. So we're just one of those eight who can block it, but we need virtually almost all of the others to block it, which is why it's so important that you contact all of the cross bench. Um, we've got one here that says there was a federal green policy put forward to take out from state budgets any income states get from taxing EVs. Sam, do you know what's happening? Mm. Yes, well, that is the private members bill that our, our federal uh, Greens introduced, Janet Rice, our transport spokesperson. And that was a way of blocking the tax at uh, the federal level, which is essentially saying to states, well, if you raise this revenue through an EV tax, uh, we'll take it off you through our, uh, through our, I think, our, um, no GST distributions or what have you, um, and uh, so that that bill has now gone to a, a um, committee stage and had a court inquiry into into that bill. Uh, interestingly enough, as well, one of the reasons you know put forward uh, by the, the the government to do this is it'll said, "Oh, we'll do it before the the federal government does it." Uh, there's nothing to stop. My understanding is there's nothing to stop if the federal government at some point a later date wants to override the state and bring in a, a road user charge th there's nothing to actually stop them from from doing that um and so this i guess that that just shows just what a what a uh, unnecessary rush job this this tax is absolutely um les has got a really good question here he says has there been any talk about the government offering a compromise like a ten thousand dollar subsidy up front for new evs for a few years as an offset until the cost becomes comparable with petrol cars. So yes, Liz, absolutely. This is um, something that the government is actively thinking about. Um, the good thing about the amount of backlash that they've had to this tax is now they're scrambling to figure out a way to sweeten the deal to get the crossbench to support it. So we know that there's a number of the crossbenchers who will not support it in and of itself, but might support the tax if the government offers some kind of sweetener, like a grant to say, you know, for the next few years, you can have a $5,000 grant to buy an electric vehicle until say EV sales um, come on parity with petrol cars. Now, it's good that, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's our policy is to have these upfront grants. So that's good in a way, but this tax is still going to be a disincentive. And I don't think the government is going to come up with enough of a grant to make it worth it. Um, but also we need to get that 
that first hurdle first, which is to show the government they will not have the numbers in the crossbench for the tax. Otherwise, if they get the numbers on the crossbench for a tax in and of itself, they've got no reason then to do a subsidy or an incentive as well. Um, Sam, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I think it's worth it's worth um, uh, worth saying that even with uh, a subsidy or what have you, a modest subsidy that the state government comes with, even a generous subsidy that the state government comes up with, um, it's still going to be a, a pretty competitive market there for electric vehicles. You know, the cost is still going to be it's going to be quite competitive, uh, and so. Uh, as it's been, you know, put to me, if you, if, if someone's going, you know, 50-50 or on the fence, maybe thinking about an EV, but not quite sure, and then they've got this whole new um, road user charge, you know, EV tax put in put in front of them, uh, just the just the fact that there's this whole other hurdle uh, that they've got to go through that they're unsure about, that's going to be a real disincentives for a uh, real disincentive for electric vehicles, uh, and so what the government really should be doing is yes, putting in. Uh, incentives and subsidies and be as generous as they can. We need to match what they're doing in uh, Europe and other countries. Uh, but let's actually see those EV sales actually go up. There seems to be a lot of uh, presumption by government that EV sales are just gonna somehow magically um, take off uh, when we know that we're already at the lowest rate pretty much in the, in, uh, in the world. Now, there's no guarantee that that will happen. So let's actually get the rate of um, sales of electric vehicles up significantly before the government actually can consider this this uh, EV tax. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess the the main point to take home is we do need to contact the cross benches because if the government thinks they can get the numbers for the tax without any kind of subsidy or grant, that they'll go for that route, um, and we need to show them that at least enough crossbenchers saying no way we're not we're not supporting this and then force the government to negotiate some kind of package which you know in the end that might be what gets up it's better than no package but we actually need to show them we're not going to get away with nothing with just the tax. Um, Jaya says if I could only state two things to a crossbencher what would the best arguments be? My view is just say that you're opposed to it. That's the main thing. They need to know that you are watching and that you're opposed to it and you don't want to vote for people who vote for the electric vehicle tax. Really, it's as simple as that. If you wanted to add something to your argument, um, you could just talk about your personal experience. You know, you're considering buying electric vehicle, but the upfront price or this, this new tax will be a disincentive to you. Or just say whatever's true to you. If you're a driver of an electric vehicle, say that. If you want to buy one, say that. If you're just concerned about emissions and transport emissions are the fastest rising, say that. Say whatever argument works for you. Okay, so a few more in here. Um, we've got a couple of people who've made some good points about people living in regional and rural areas. Um, people who maybe have purchased an electric vehicle and are traveling a lot more than city drivers, you know, 40, 50,000 kilometers a year, which means that this tax will be quite a significant annual cost for them. And um, we've got Michael here who said that in a few years, farmers may have a choice between buying an electric vehicle, farm vehicle or a diesel. They'll get a diesel fuel rebate, but have to pay an electric vehicle tax and how ridiculous that is. Do you have any comments about that, Sam? Mm, well, look, um, uh, my understanding is that the government have, um, in terms of what they believe this will cost the average um, uh, driver around a few hundred dollars, uh, that I think that they're not factoring in um, just how how much an EV, and the average EV driver actually drives, and they've under, under underestimated that or understated that. It's going to be even worse for uh, rural drivers as well, as, as Michael has pointed out, uh, they're going to be paying a lot more. Uh, a lot more than um, than uh, metropolitan drivers as well, and so I think that's a really good a really good message uh, for our rural crossbench MPs. Uh, the disproportionate impact it's going to have have on um, those those uh, people who want to who are either driving or want to drive an EV uh, in rural areas. Yeah, absolutely, and a lot of people do the calculations right. They go oh, I actually drive a lot, that's a huge percentage of my cost, so I'm actually going to save money by buying electric vehicle because I drive a lot, and yeah, therefore yep. they're people who drive more than average who've made that 
calculations for themselves are now going to have to factor in an extra thousand, two thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and over the life of a vehicle, you know, that's push that's pushing it up to, to ten to twenty twenty grand. That's not a that's that's a significant amount. That's a significant barrier. Hmm. Um, we have a question here that you might know the answer to, Sam. Will the tax apply to EVs purchased elsewhere in Australia or registered elsewhere in Australia? That is a really good question. My understanding uh, is that will only apply at this moment to uh, vehicles in registered in Victoria because it'll be through the Victorian, uh, through Vic Roads registration system. Uh, but we can look into that, we'll make sure that we look into that detail and get back to you. That's my understanding. Uh, and Les, and it just yeah, it goes to show just how ridiculous it is for one state to be doing something like this um, on their own. And when all the other states have pulled out, it's silly for Victoria to be going it alone. Um, I can imagine if you live in a border town or something, it's going to be pretty ridiculous. Um, Les says the tax requires users to self-report the kilometres they travel. Will this work? And what does the government intend to do if users under-report or just refuse to pay? Well, my understanding is that there are significant. So my understanding at the moment is uh, they've gone for a, a pretty, a pretty uh, rough and ready scheme, which means you'll be taking a photo of your your odometer and sending it into to Vic Roads. Uh, and <clears throat> if you uh, underreport or don't do that, there's some significant penalties if you don't, don't do that. Significant penalties if you don't uh, keep your records. <laughs> That's yeah. my understanding of how it's going to work. Yeah, users will be required, my understanding is to keep records for five years and there will be random checks of odometers as well. Um, Alex asks, is there somewhere that we can read the bill? Sorry, Ellen, can you? Uh... Is there, Alex asks, is there somewhere we can read the bill? And um, yes, you can find it on the Victorian Parliament website. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions about it, because sometimes Victorian legislation can be a little bit um, difficult to wade through, just shoot us an email. Uh, Wendy asks, when does the vote happen in the upper house? So the, um, we don't know, I guess is the short answer. It was um, introduced into parliament last sitting week, which was the week of the 16th of March. Um, we don't sit again until the first week of May. So our understanding is that first week of May is when they're hoping to debate it and pass it through the lower house, which means then you have to wait till the next sitting week for it to go to the upper house. So the absolute earliest it could get to the upper house would be mid-May. Is that your understanding, Sam? Andrew asks, how does your odometer meter work when you drive outside of Victoria? Do you have to take a new photo every time you cross the border? Well, that's a very, that's a very good point. And uh, that's one of the things that probably hasn't been quite thought through from the government uh, in introducing this. Uh, that uh, one of the reasons why it's so silly that they're going alone, and that's gonna, I think there's gonna be significant issues with that, that, that aspect of it. Yeah. All right, just seeing what other questions are coming through here. Um, Sam, could you talk a little bit more about um, our policy around fleet? Um, we've got Scott here who's just talking about, is there a possibility to extend business or fleet tax write-offs for petrol and diesel utes and four-wheel drives to electric vehicles to create a big market for electric uh, well, that's in regards to private fleets. One of the focuses that we've had is on government fleets, um, where um, you know government obviously has a has a large has a large fleet of vehicles that it uses it's for its purpose. I think Victoria is around ten thousand fleet, uh, and uh, one of the things that the government can do is transition its entire fleet over to EVs. Uh, not only does that have benefits now, but then that flows onto the second hand market as well. So suddenly you've got a whole bunch of EVs now. After the on the on the second hand market after they've been used by government, um, by way of example, I think uh, Victoria only has uh, a handful of electric vehicles on plug-in hybrids as part of their ten thousand fleet. I think it's only around thirty odd mark. Uh, by by way of example, um, Joe Biden has announced he wants to transition the entire U.S. government fleet of around six hundred thousand vehicles over to electric vehicles. Um, other states are looking at doing that. 
but in Victoria we've had we don't have an official policy there's no uh, <coughs> announcement in place in fact from my, my figures and I, we get the figures generally every year we ask at estimates hearings uh, the rate of electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids per the entire fleet has actually been going down um, so it's not a, it's not a great um, it's not something the Victorian government has done uh, but it needs to be something that's, that's a key part of uh, any future EV policy. Absolutely. Um, David says you feel sorry for hybrid drivers, they get stung twice. Is this the case? So David, my understanding is that this tax will apply to plug-in hybrids, but not petrol, um, you know, like I drive a Prius, which is not a plug-in hybrid. It's one of the older hybrids. Um, they won't be subject to it, but the plug-in hybrids will, but at a slightly lower rate than electric vehicles. So yes, technically they will get slugged twice, but with the on the electric vehicle tax, because they're also paying the ex petrol excise, but on the um, electric vehicle tax, they'll be slugged at a, a slightly lower rate. Um, Keith has a question here around Victorian Labor wanting to sell off part of Vic Roads. Um, and will putting a growth tax in place increase the sale price for the state government? Sam, you actually had an opinion piece about this yes, in the yeah. age a little um, while ago. This is one of the big unanswered questions that the government uh, has not has not answered yet. Um, what we know uh, is that the uh, the EV tax will be administered by the registration function of Vic Roads, and we know that the government is looking to privatise that particular function of Vic Roads. Um, this government is addicted to privatisation. We've had the Port of Melbourne, the Land Titles Office and many other public assets being looked to be sold off by this government. So what that'll mean is potentially uh, the revenue taken in by this EV tax will form part of the privatisation or will actually go to, or part of it will actually go to a private company. Uh, that means the focus will be on uh, that private, private company's revenue stream um, this is a real unanswered question by the government. Um, and yes, it does stand to reason uh, that passing this EV tax will make uh, Vic Roads, the licence and registration function of Vic Roads, much more attractive for privatisation and for sale to a private company. Uh, and it will mean that the government may uh, receive, you know, the government will receive a much bigger upfront uh, 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 price for it. Um, and what it'll also mean then is that Victorians, or well, those who have to pay this uh, tax will then be paying for a private company and it'll be upward pressure on those rates. Um, so it's a big, it is, a, it is, it does stand to reason. Uh, and it's a big unanswered question that this government has not answered yet. Thanks, Sam. Um, that's pretty much all the questions that people have uh, submitted. So last chance now to submit any um, questions that you have. Last one from Keith, just around electric buses is more of a statement, but he's been saying that the Victorian government has been kicking the can down the road for several years by running pilot studies, one after the other. That's absolutely right, Keith. A number of years ago in 2017, the Greens actually used our numbers in Parliament to uh, start an inquiry into electric vehicles, particularly around buses. Um, and so the government way back then in 2017, 2018, started some pilots and then last year they re-announced another pilot with one electric bus here in Melbourne and it, they are very far behind the rest of the world, um, even behind places like the ACT. There's real big capacity to actually be building uh, electric buses here in Australia uh, and here in Victoria, the components of those buses as well. So there's real, real capacity for uh, industry creation through um, transitioning our uh, bus fleet to electric buses um, and you know again you've got some very ambitious plans in New South Wales you've got other you've got other um, places around the world who are probably manufacturing or buying electric buses uh, at a rate um, that would you know uh, more than more than what we the amount of buses that we have here in, in Victoria a year um, so we're just getting left behind and there aren't any there's no excuses you know we see what's happening around the world what other governments are doing there are absolutely no excuses to be um, to be left behind, left behind like we are. And you know, EV, whether it's incentives, whether it's electric buses, whether it's fleet, um, there's so many things we're going to be doing here in Victoria. Yes, and Scott says in terms of selling Vic Roads, why else would 
the government introduce an unpopular new tax that generates such little amount of revenue now, if not mm. around privatisation? Well, I think yes. Scott, we've, we've partly answered that by saying, Sam said, well, they, they can, they, they're going to get, they think they can get away with it. We've also talked about the fact that they're trying to revenue grab from the feds and pick a bit of a fight with the feds. Um, but Sam. Yeah, well, one of the real one of the real risks, uh, as I've seen in in um, this being entangled with uh, the privatisation of Vic Roads or privatisation in general is, I think there's a there is a general and wide understanding that, you know, uh, we will need at some point a road user charge. The big risk is that uh, a road user charge, a privatised road user user charge, will be about the profits and revenue uh, of uh, private companies. A government-run scheme would be about managing congestion, <coughs> not about revenue, and, and that's the way we've got to go. Sorry, my voice is finally backed up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sam. Um, I'm just checking the last little question came in. Um, so we've got one here from Spike. Bus Tech has locally designed and built an electric bus, but no one is buying it. Well, that's right. If there's no um, company or government that's buying them, then there's not much incentive to make them really. Um, Scott says his suspicion is that EVs could incentivise renewable power. So are Labor trying to hang on to coal power by doing this? I, I don't think that's the main motivation for this. I think it's everything else that Sam has talked about, but obviously um, the electricity emissions in Victoria are going down, but we still get more than 50% of our energy in Victoria from coal, which is pretty awful. Um, and we do not have any plans to transition out of coal, the Victorian government here, despite what all the good things they say about renewable energy. Um, and as I said, transport emissions from direct petrol and diesel vehicles are increasing. So there's a lot of climate impacts wrapped up in this that we need to um, deal with it. Um, Wendy says the commitment to charging infrastructure is tiny, needs to expand by a factor of about 100. Yeah, absolutely. So charging infrastructure is obviously another big part of this. Uh, the state government is doing more in this space than they are in you know, anything else to incentivise electric vehicles. They are building some charging infrastructure and councils are also stepping up to do it. But uh, as we mentioned, it's it's a small amount and we need to do so much more than just here's a few shiny charging stations, therefore we're doing enough. That's, that's not really the way that we need to go. Um, and then we also had a question saying the health, or a comment saying the health costs. Um, I'm just trying to read this on my little screen. And um, the health costs of diesel vehicles is significant. Why charge electric vehicles which have zero harm when diesels cause harm and the costs are not charged? Well, this is a really good point that I think has has been missed, and we haven't even covered it that much tonight. Is that the health costs of petrol and diesel vehicles are hugely significant and we're actually learning more and more about them all the time. Um, if Tim Reid was here, who's our health spokesperson and a doctor, he, he's always going on about this. He would, he would chew your ear off about it. The impacts of poor air quality on people's health are just becoming more and more significant and we're learning more and more about it every single day. And so I think this is something that is, it's an externality that's not factored in when we talk about our transport system and something that is only going to get much more significant as we realise just how harmful these emissions are. Um, and Scott says diesels call more deaths from respiratory disease per year than died in the bushfires. Yeah, it's, it's huge and it's getting bigger and we're learning more about it every day. So the government's um, really, not taking that into account at all when it's thinking about our transport system. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. So I think we've just about exhausted everybody's questions. Thank you to people who've left comments. Um, one last one, which I think is a good reminder from Jai, who says, could Labor MPs split off and vote against their party? Is it worth contacting them? Look, it is worth contacting them. They will not split off against their party. <laughs> That's for sure. It's never happened since we've been in parliament. 
it is up to the crossbench now. So please, if, if you want to email your Labor and Liberal MPs, do so. They need to hear that this is unpopular, but it's the crossbench who needs to hear it more than anyone. So we will once again put the link in here to the email addresses and phone numbers of all the crossbenchers. Call all of them, email all of them if you can. If you've done it once, do it again. It is the most impactful thing you can do right now. If the crossbench supports this tax, it will go through. If they don't, it won't. That's the simple facts of the matter. Sam, did you have any other parting comments if your voice will allow it? No, that's, I think you've, I think you've, got, you've nailed it, Ellen. You're right, if you've written to them, uh, call them, if you've called them, meet with them, do whatever, do whatever you can, but make sure that uh, everyone's voice is heard. Um, this is the way that we're gonna knock this thing off. And we'll keep you updated. We'll keep up the fight in parliament and in the community, hopefully that we can knock off this tax and get something better in its place. And also thank you to the industry and there's some people um, here from the Electric Vehicles Council industry on this call as well. The industry has been really staunch at standing up against this and uh, working with us on this. So thank you very much. We know that when we work together, we can get really good outcomes and hopefully we can get a good outcome on this one. Have a good night, everyone, and feel free to email Sam or I if you have any further questions or comments. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam and Ellen. Yeah, thanks for all your good work and thanks for organising this. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Also, can I say, I think it's a good format. Um, to do it, again. it worked clearly good. Wonderful. Thank you. You poor thing. Should we um, do a oh. review? I'm just going to stop. <laughs> Hang on. I'm just going to um, just pause the, just turn off the recording. <laughs>